On the occasion when Jesus' disciples came to him, after having pointed out to them when they were showing him the buildings of the temple, and he said, I'm telling you, there's coming a time when there will not be left one stone here upon another that's not thrown down. They came to him and asked him, when are these things going to be, and what are going to be the signs of your coming at the end of the age? He told them a lot of very disturbing things as he talked to them about this, and they were no doubt very sobered by it. In Matthew 24 and verse 9, he said, Then they're going to deliver you up to be afflicted and kill you. You'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake, and many shall be offended, which means they will stumble, and they will betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. In the church of God, we have plainly come to that time when the love of many people has waxed cold. There was another time. There was a time when all of us were really on fire and very much full of love. We were in love with God's work. We were in love with his law. We were in love with his ways. We were in love with his church. We were in love with one another. And we look forward to Christ's kingdom, to his coming, the establishment of his rule upon the earth. We talked about it after church. We speculated about how things would be in the millennium. We talked about it over dinner. We, we, it was just a part of, of our lives. We were a people who looked for the coming of our Lord. But just as Jesus wrote also to the church at Ephesus that they had lost their first love, truth is, we have lost ours as well. And it's still gone. Now this is not merely something to tut-tut over and say, well, that's too bad. That's uh, really very unfortunate. Because the loss of our power to love has really very serious consequences. The consequences are outlined in Revelation 2 when Jesus writes this letter to the church at Ephesus about this very problem. He said to the angel of the church at Ephesus, Revelation 2 verse 1, These saying things saith he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know your works, I know your labor, I know your patience, and you have borne and have patience, and for my name's sake have labored and have not fainted. But verse 4 says this, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you, because you have left your first love. And it could just as easily be said to us. Then he says this, Remember therefore from whence you are fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else. And that or, or else ought to be sobering to every single one of us. Or else I will come to you quickly, and will remove your candlestick out of his place, except you repent. Now it is odd, in a way, that he makes no reference here to their having lost their first obedience, their having lost their first righteousness, their having lost their first doctrines, are not mentioned. What he says is, you have lost your first love. It was the love and the power to love that was gone. It happened to us. And I saw it go. I did not know what was happening at the time. But looking back, I can see it. I know it. It is as clear as day to me. A man named Rollo May, a psychologist who was right, wrote a book called Love and Will. And he made a statement in that book that has stayed in my mind ever since I first read it. It, it imprinted on me. He said that when men lose the power to love, they substitute power over. And I have seen it again and again and again. It happens in families, it happens in homes, and it happened in the church. The substitution took place over time. And the substitution was very subtle. It happened in some measure because we were afraid. Fear, you know, is, is one of those things that people of faith should not be worried with. It shouldn't, shouldn't be a part of what makes their decision-making process, but it does. We were afraid, for example, of diversity among ourselves. 
One of the great losses in this whole situation was at a time when the church got so afraid, the ministry got so afraid of a division that was taking place among the women in the church over a really important issue, whether they wore makeup or not, that the church felt we had to get together and make a decision that was binding upon the whole church and that that decision had to somehow be enforced across the whole church because we were afraid that some women wearing makeup in the church and some women not, that there would be a lot of judging of one another. Of course there would. Did we think it ended when they stopped wearing makeup? That there would be judging and, 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 and differences of opinion and divergences, and so there was a necessity of dealing with it. We were afraid of other doctrines. We were afraid of other ideas. We were afraid in some cases that our arguments might not stand up to scrutiny, or at least that you people who are members of the church, being the unlearned ones among us, would not be able to stand up to other people's arguments. We were afraid that someone would take you sheep and, and, and spirit you away. We also had the fear of the prodigal son's brother. Remember him? He was the man who stayed home, worked, and bore the heat of the day. And when his brother, who was prodigal, came back, he was offended because that one got as much as he had gotten, even though he himself had stayed there through the whole time. We were afraid maybe that after we had made all these sacrifices, God might let someone into his kingdom that had not made quite so many. And we were, in very large measure, afraid of losing control. Afraid of losing control. And because we were afraid, we lost confidence in love. We couldn't really trust love to carry the church through. We couldn't really trust love to hold the church together, to bind our hearts together. Remember the song we sing, Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love? We couldn't really trust love. And so we began to turn away from it. It may sound strange after all these years to look back on it, but we actually began to put down love. Love and expressions of love that were seen place to place were sometimes called just sentiment and sentimentalism. And we don't want to get involved in, in sentimentalism. And we began to excuse our lack of love by declaring love to be Protestant. And especially the expressions of love that might turn up in certain songs, certain acts, certain ways of going about doing things, and certain ways of, of talking. And in the place of love, we substituted church government. In the place of love, we substituted authority. In the place of love, we substituted legalism. In the place of love, we substituted discipline. In the place of love, we substituted exclusivism. And so we moved on into the world preaching the truth and not realizing any more than the church at Ephesus did that we had left behind our power to love. And the truth is we laid it down. You know, it wasn't taken away from us. It wasn't stolen from us. We just laid it down. And after all this had happened, and after the church had paid this price of laying down love and substituting for love authority, legalism, doctrine, discipline, exclusivism, church government, a terrible thing happened. We lost our church. We lost church government. We lost our authority. We lost the doctrinal discipline. We lost control. And since we had long since lost our power to love, we were bereft. Bereft of any virtue. We were, and we still are, a pitiful thing to behold. Why would I say that? Well, when it really came, came home to me was at the last Friends of the Sabbath meeting I attended in Sydney, Australia. And a fellow was there who was uh, making presentations, another Church of God minister. And he decided on his presentations this year to tell the story of how the Worldwide Church of God had come apart. And as I sat and I listened to it, it actually was a very open and very frank discussion of our failures. And I was struck then with the realization, and I've spoken of it since, that the Worldwide Church of God has been the biggest failure in the history of the Church of God. But what really struck me, sitting in the room, because around me were Seventh-day Adventists and Seventh-day Baptists and other Sabbatarian people, I could sense or feel the pity that other Sabbatarians and the Adventists present had for this poor, 
disheartened and discouraged church of God. And I was ashamed. I was not ashamed of my faith. I was not ashamed of my belief systems. I was ashamed of the failure of my church. And the truth is that all of us from the Worldwide Church of God to Global to United to the Living Room Church of God or every other you know, church there is out here are all wounded and sick and sore. And we are not in any condition to love those little ones whom God might, might, might otherwise send to us because, with some exceptions, we have lost the power to love. Here, what the Spirit says to the churches. Remember, therefore, from whence you are fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly, and I will remove your candlestick out of its place, except you repent. Well, what can you do about it? There is no store where you can go and buy love. There any place you can go out and get it. You can't just wish it were so. You can't sit around your closet somewhere at home and work up love. It just does not seem to how, how to work that way. Now, in the past several months, I've made a very strong of the, point of the importance of loving one another, of taking care of one another, of doing good to one another. I feel that I've, I've spoken of how, how desperately I hope that we'll never have a circumstance where one of the elderly people in our church would fall in their bathtub and hurt and be lie, lie there for three or four days with nobody knowing that they were there and no one knowing that they were hurt. That we would check on one another, that we would know about one another. That when we were sick in the hospital, somebody would come see us. I mean, I, I really think that we've learned some important things about that. And I am pleased that we are doing better at that. But I've come to realize something that I don't know that I quite had in focus before. Our love for one another can never be what it must be unless we deal with one other matter first. We have got to learn to love God all over again. Because the truth is that it is only in experiencing the love of God that you can gain the power to love. For the power to love comes from Him. It doesn't come from one another. For without Him, we can't retain it. It all starts with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's where it begins. The awareness that Jesus Christ died for me. The awareness that his love, blood was shed for me. And the awareness that God so loved me that he was willing to give his own Son. And you know... As great as the sacrifice that Jesus Christ himself made of laying down his life for his sins, I think most parents would as soon lay down their life as to lay down the life of one of their children. Which was the greater sacrifice, the one the Father made or the one that Jesus made? Paul, writing to the Romans, says something also very important. In chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience, patience experience, experience hope. And I can remember a time when, when we really did glory in tribulations, that there was a joy and awareness that we were doing the right thing, that we were obeying God, that we were putting our life on the line in order to do the right thing. And we would have been willing to make enormous sacrifices for the sake of God, for the sake of His work, because we also knew that this was building patience and experience and hope, and that we were growing in character to be more like God. And hope makes not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. There is a source for the power to love, and it is not inside yourself. It is not even in the Bible that you hold in your lap or on your knees. It is the power of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which God has given to us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. I mean, pretty hard 
to die in the place of another of a, of a good man. Yet peradventure for a good man, there are those who would even be willing to die. But God commends his love toward us in that when we were not good people, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We did not, have, we did not go up to heaven to bring him down. We did not get good enough for him to come down. We did not qualify for his sacrifice. We didn't somehow become worthy of his sacrifice that he was going to make for us. His decision and the sacrifice and everything he did was carried out for us when we had not lifted a finger toward him, when we have no thoughts toward him, while we were still sinners and had not taken the first step away from it. That source of the power to love comes only from God and from his spirit and from understanding this point that Paul makes, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us, that God gave his own son, that we would not perish, but have everlasting life. Now the bulk of this message I want to take with you to you today comes from 1 John. The same man that wrote, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, has much to say about the matter of the love of God and the power to love and there are lessons in here, I think, that need to be gotten into our heads so that we never, in, our, in this lifetime, lose them again. Behold, chapter 3, verse 1 of 1 John. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God, the sons of God. The world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he will appear, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Now, you know, one of the things that so struck me when I first was a part of the Church of God, when I first came to understand the teachings of the Worldwide Church of God, of Herbert W. Armstrong, as he laid them out for us, was a little booklet called, Why Were You Born? Remember it? Some of you may never have seen this little booklet. We need to get that truth back into print again, I think, and begin to put it more into people's hearts and minds. I had never understood this before. Herbert was not the first one to, to gain this knowledge. It is believed by any number of other Christians. C.S. Lewis speaks of it in one of his books. I believe the Greek Orthodox Church actually holds this as a doctrine. And that is that this love that the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, and that when he appears we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The truth is that man is to become like God. In fact, as Herbert Armstrong used to put it, man is destined to become God, as God is God. Well, the first time I heard that statement, I thought it was blasphemy. And to this day, a lot of people are afraid to embrace that concept. They are afraid of it. And they find other ways of expressing it and ways of maybe, you know, uh, padding it a little bit around the edges so it doesn't, doesn't quite, you know, seem as strong as it otherwise would seem. But I realized when I read this again this morning and I thought about it, that one of the places where, from whence the power to love came from, one of the realizations of the love of God was in what he was doing with us here. You have to look around you at the world and think, what in the world do people think God is doing? Is this a soap opera down here? Is he sitting up on his throne in heaven with a clicker? And he looks in your house for a while, and he looks in this house for a while, and he watches this affair over here, and he watches this, this, this beating that somebody takes place over here. It's like your television set. You know, you go from place to place to place to place to see all the evil in the world. And a little good tucked over in a corner somewhere. Is that what God is doing? Is there no point? Is there no purpose? And frankly, of all the other things that I have read, of all the other doctrines that I have ever seen, of what God is doing here and of what the destiny of man is, they all leave great giant holes, either in logic or belief or in doctrine or in the Bible or what have you. Nothing explains what God is putting man through down here except the truth that man is destined to become God. Oh, there's... A lot to be explained in addition to that. But the realization of that, the awareness of that, 
that his love is so great that he is going to share his own being with us, take us into his own family, share his power, his glory, and all the things, and his love with us, ought to change a man's life. Ought to change the way we think. Ought to change our capacity to love others, to give to others. It's a life-changing belief. Later, in verse 10 of chapter 3, he says this, In this are the children of God manifest and the children of the devil. Whoever does not righteousness is not of God, neither is he that loves not his brother. Now you can define righteousness in such a way that you can measure up to it. You know, you can fast twice a week. You can give tithes of all you possess. You can keep the Sabbath. You can keep the holy days. All that stuff. You can define it in such a way that you can achieve it. But what are you going to do about the last part of this? For all those things that the Pharisees did were not enough. In this are the children of God made manifest, and the children of the devil. Whoever does not righteousness is not of God. Neither is he who doesn't love his brother. But where does the power to love your brother come from? For this is the message you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not like Cain, who was of that wicked one who slew his brother. And wherefore did he kill him? Because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Now don't marvel, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loves not his brother abides in death. But where does the power to love your brother come from? How are you going to get to there? How are you going to feel it? How are you going to respond to it? Now, I understand that love is not a feeling, that love is a behavior. But, you know, you have to understand that even the behavior has to find a source of power somewhere. There has to be the energy to do those things. There has to be the desire to do those things. There has to be something somewhere down inside of us that empowers us to be able to do the things that are involved with loving our brother. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God. How is it that you can see it? Because this is where your love, your capacity, your power to love comes from, is from the love of God. Then how do you perceive it? Because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. How does it work? Well, he continues in verse 17 to tell us precisely how it works. Whoever has this world's good and sees his brother having need and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? Now, isn't that an interesting phrase? He doesn't say, this guy who does this doesn't love his brother. He says, how does the love of God dwell in him. Now what does that mean? Does it mean how can he possibly love God? Or how is, is there not in him a love that comes from God? And I have to conclude frankly that it is the, the latter of those two concepts. That unless you are able to find somehow the ability to do these things for your brother, then the love of God doesn't dwell in you. Now he says, my little children, let's don't love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed. And in truth, let it touch your life. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows all things. Beloved, if our heart doesn't condemn us, God is greater than our heart. I'm sorry, I think I slipped one. If our heart condemn us not, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. We keep his commandments and we please him. Why would we do that? Well... There's one of two reasons. One is you're afraid that if you don't do it, he's going to smack you. And the other one is because you really want him to be pleased with you. Now, how many people are there that you know that you care a fig whether they are pleased with you or not? Does it really matter that they care what you do or don't do? Does it really matter how they feel about you? 
The list of people that you really care what they think about you is a short list. And it is pretty well uh, the same list as of the people that you love. Whatever we ask, we receive in his, light, in his sight because we keep his commandment and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keeps his commandments dwells in him, and he in him, and hereby we know that he abides in us by the spirit that he has given us. It's terrific, you know, the man, because the truth is the man that knows God, the man that loves God, is a man who keeps God's commandments because he understands them as a way of life. He cares what pleases God, and he lives that way. There's an interesting thing about all this, and I hadn't really thought about it in a very long time. But the church of God that I used to know was a very loving church. Now, to those of you who came along in later years, that may sound strange to you. It may not match your experiences with the church of God. But the fact is, there was a great deal of affection, a great deal of caring, a great deal of sharing of things with one another, so that one concludes that we had not at that particular point in time lost our power to love. And that we found great joy in the obedience to God. We found great joy in Sabbath keeping. We found in a great, you know, even though men lost jobs and gave up careers over the holy days, they were, they were pleased to do so because they felt it was pleasing to God. It was done out of an attitude of love and of joy. And they knew that there would be a reward for the sacrifices that they made on behalf of God. And there was a sharing together and a leaning on one another and a telling of stories back and forth and of, of caring about what people did for that reason. In the process of time, this changed. It changed in subtle ways, as I said, and it changed slowly, but it did change. Chapter 4. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. And what he is saying is that basically God is the fountain source of love, that that capacity to love comes from him. And the degree to which it is either there, or it is suppressed, or it is substituted for something else is substituted for it, all these things have to do with how close you are to God. He that does not love, does not know God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because God sent his only begotten Son in the world, that we might live through him. He cares so much for us that he made this sacrifice in order that we might live as opposed to die, not just get washed away or flushed down the drain or what have you, but that we might live. Live for what? Well, he's already told us that we might be like him, that we might see him as he is. There's a line in one of the songs I hear from time to time on Christian music radio that it talks about the fact, you know, that, that, that everything belongs to God, that, that is everything, the universe, the creation is God and God alone. It speaks of how, that when we're with him, that God alone will be our only joy. Our, I'm sorry, our greatest joy. And it, somehow it just always hits me when I hear that line in the song to realize that, and, and I make the comparison with some people that I have known in my life whom I thoroughly enjoy being with. There have been some that have been my very closest friends, the people that I've known the best and loved the most, that I love to be with, and it's a joy, and it dawned on me that of the most engaging personalities, the most pleasing type of person, the, the, the one who would be the greatest joy to be around is God and God alone. And the songs about seeing his face, the songs about being in his presence, began to make more sense to me because I realized that, that it is this person who is a loving person, who is an absolute fountain source of love, is going to be a wonderful being to share time with, to be with, to share work with. Herein, he says, is love. That we, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. 
No man has seen God at any time, but if we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. Verse 15. Whoever will confess that Jesus is the Son of God dwells in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has to us. And this, this is where you go to buy love. It is in the court where you sit and you listen to the testimony. And having heard the testimony of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and Paul, and having heard the testimony of Moses and Elijah and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and you put all the testimony together and you know and you've come to the place to where you really believe that God loves you, it is there that you can actually begin to find the love of God in you, which can actually be shared with someone else. He that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. Herein, verse 17, is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. As he has the capacity to love in the world, he can share with us and give us that same capacity to love in the world. And it seems to me that the first step toward that place is the recognition that you are not in that place. You must first know where you are. You must first know what is not there. Then you must first know what to go looking for. And you must know the place to go looking and how to find it. There is no fear in love. So maybe, maybe we had begun to lose a gri our grip on love when we started to be afraid, when we started to worry about losing control or about the unity of the organization that led us to impose church discipline on so many questions and problems. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. And so, if we are afraid, we have immediately a clue that we have something to look for. We, the search is on. We need to start trying to find it. And verse 19 is one of the most profound statements you'll ever find in your Bible. We love him because he first loved us. Love starts with him. It's in believing him, accepting him, saying, yes, I know that you love me. Yes, I know that you care about me. And you know, that seems so obvious that I should say that. But how often I have come into contact with people who really aren't sure that God loves them. Because they think, if he really loved me, would this be happening? If he really loved me, would he allow that? If God really loved me, if God really cared, there are people who believe that God hates them. There are people who believe that God is down on them, that God is punishing them, that God's not going to ever let up on them. Why do they believe that? Well, it's basically because they do not believe God. And they have not come to the place to where they can say, I believe in his love, therefore I know that what is happening to me has a purpose. Therefore I know he would not, anyone who I believe that God loves me, and no one who loves me would allow me to go through this unless he had something very important in mind for me. And I said it long ago, and I will say it again. I do not believe there is any way to understand what God is putting us through here on the, this planet right now unless we understand that our destiny is to be like him. That our destiny is to be empowered as he is empowered. And the preparation for that requires the greatest sacrifices that you and I could ever imagine so that we can learn, so we can grow, for people who have suffered are not nearly so likely to inflict suffering on others. We love him because he first loved us. And if a man say, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? I can't get around that. I can't explain it away. There's no other angle I can ever find on that. But at the same time, 
I have to realize that while the love for God comes first, it's his love for me that even precedes that. And it is only by tapping that that I can get the power to love. And having achieved the power to love, having been given the power to love, and it is a great gift, I've also been forced to see that it's also possible to lay it down, to substitute something else for it, to give it up. This commandment, verse 21, we have from him, that he who love God, loves God, love his brother also. Chapter 5, verse 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And that's another argument about born and begotten. I won't go into that. Everyone that loves him that begat loves him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and we keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. And it was from passages like this, actually, I'm sorry, it was from the abuse of passages like this, that we began to try to justify the substitution of the idea of obedience in the place of the power to love. But you see, there really isn't, it isn't really a thing, a thing of substitution. That the commandments of God, the obedience to the commandments of God, arising out of a full heart of love for God, makes all kinds of sense. What's interesting is that some Protestants substituted the idea of love in the place of obedience to God. We replace the love of God with the idea of commandment keeping. And I say the idea of commandment keeping because I'm not sure how well we did at that. Turns out that both of us were in the ditch when you get right down to it. The sad truth is that commandment keeping that is not born out of love won't hold. Commandment keeping that is born out of fear. <clears throat> commandment keeping that is born out of doctrinal arguments. Commandment keeping that is born out of church discipline. Commandment keeping that is born out of groupthink and group psychology and going along, that simply will not hold. Because without the power to love, we don't really have the power to obey. We don't really have the power to observe the Sabbath as God intended. We don't really have the power. I mean, we can write the check for our tithes, but the real empowerment that comes from God that involves the giving of the man and of the self first and of your possession second, you don't have that. It's the power of love that gives the power to really obey. The Pharisees substituted their own traditions for the law of God, I mean, for the love of God. We substituted our doctrines for the love of God. Neither will hold. So what do you do about it? Where do you, person, individual, member of God's church, where do you start doing something about this? Well, you seek God. You seek his face. This is the old idea of prayer and meditation and study. But in the past, some substituted even the big three for the power to love. That you can substitute the discipline of, well, I, I, I'm okay because I pray an hour a day and I study my Bible an hour a day and I meditate an hour a day and I go through the motions. The Pharisee walks up and he says, I thank you, God, that I am not like other men. I fast twice in the week. And can you imagine the prayers that this man made? Can you, you know, he says, I give tithes of all that I possess. All the things, all the things, the disciplines that could be done, this man did them. But it was not done out of love. It was done out of discipline alone. Oh, discipline's good. We need discipline. We need method. We need order in our lives and so forth. But the discipline itself needs to arise out of a love for God and a desire to please Him. Because I remember very distinctly in our days, back when we were all so happy in the service of God and the love of God and the love of one another, I think back to those times, and one of the fundamentals was discipline and prayer and study and meditation. 
But these things were supposed to be drawing near to God, not merely going through the motions of fulfilling something where you do a mental checklist. I got my prayer, I got my Bible study, and I got all this in today. How do we go about doing it? One is to obey him with joy in the things that he requires of you. And he does require things of you. He actually has specific things that he requires. And don't make excuses to him when you fall short. One thing you don't do with people you love. You don't lie to them. You don't make excuses. If you were wrong, you were wrong. And you just let it be as it is. When you go to visit a brother who is sick, one thing I think that would help is to remember that it is not the brother, really, that you are visiting, that it's the Lord. Remember what Jesus said to the sheep that he put on the right hand? Blessed are you of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was sick, and you visited me. When did we do that? Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So when you go to visit a brother who is sick, realize you're visiting the Lord. When you give a meal to a person who is hungry, and when you give clothes to the naked, remember that you are giving them to the Lord, your Savior, the one who loved you above his own life. Remember that when you go to the Feast of Tabernacles, you're not on vacation. No, I'm sorry. You are not on vacation when you go to the Feast of Tabernacles. You have gone to the Feast of Tabernacles to appear before God, who loved you so much that he gave his only begotten Son, that if you believe on him, you won't perish, but you'll have everlasting life. When you play at the Feast of Tabernacles, you play before him. When you dance, you dance before him. When you eat, you eat before him and in his presence. When you rejoice, you rejoice before him. When you sing praises, you sing praises before him. When you bow down and worship, you bow down and worship before him. Perhaps our first problem is not that we don't love God. It may be that we are barely conscious of him. For indeed, if we don't play before God, if we don't eat before God, if we don't fellowship before God, if we don't share our possessions with God, then where is the consciousness of God? During that short little time when you pray before meals? Are you conscious of God then? Or are these words that you say repeatedly every time when you pray. I sometimes sense among us a, a, a curious feeling of superiority over the men of the New Old Testament. Because after all, we know so much more than they did. We have God's Spirit to reveal things that they never understood. We seem to somehow think that their religion in the Old Testament times was incomplete because they didn't know anything about Jesus. It was inferior to what we enjoy. But I want to tell you one thing about the men of the Old Testament. There is one thing that is very apparent to me when I read their works. They were men who were conscious of God. And you can't be conscious of God and not love him. There's just no way. These men of the Old Testament not only were conscious of God, they had the power to love God. Now I'm going to read you a psalm. I'm not even going to ask you to turn to it. Just fold your hands in your lap and listen as I read it. Think about this man. Think about his consciousness of God. And think about and ask the question is, did this man have the power to love God? Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is not, it is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. 
and his truth endures to all generations. It's the 100th Psalm. The man who wrote this had the power to love. May God help us to find our way to getting it back.